long time ago, I uh, was here and was working on a sermon, and I went home. And my children said, what? what did you do all day? I said, well, I was working on a sermon. They said, what was the sermon about? I said it was about spanking children. And uh, ever since, anytime I'm working on a sermon, they ask me, Daddy, is it about spanking children? Not normally, but occasionally, because parents that love us will discipline us, which includes spankings from time to time. And this is one of those verses about that subject. It says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. The word foolishness there is a word, it means, it means folly. And we'll get into that for a second, in a moment. But, you know, we, we like to think that an innocent little child like this could never do anything wrong. Right, Clayton? That guy doesn't do anything wrong, do you think? He's, he's not sure what to say right now. He's a, but uh, that, that is Zephaniah. And don't worry, he's sitting on my car, but I'm right there. I'm taking the picture, and my other hand is ready to catch him. He did not fall successfully. But uh, Zephaniah is nine months old. And the Bible has a lot to say about children. In fact, children, Jesus tells us, are a model of faith for us. I'm going to flip over to Luke chapter 18 for just a moment. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 15. Picture's covering up the total there. But verse 15. And they brought unto him all infants, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called unto them, uh, called them unto him and said, Suffer or allow little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall no wise enter therein. Now, Clayton, you're probably too old for the little children that Jesus is referencing. He's referencing kids like little Zephaniah. Zephaniah can do what on his own? You know, he can cry, he can eat, he can make a mess, he's crawling, which is, you know, I, sometimes I wonder, why do we get excited when children crawl and walk? Because now what do they do? Now they get in the dog food, now they get into this, now you gotta, you know, where are they at? So you have to corral them and stuff, right? Uh, sort of on his own, he's going to get into trouble. So he's completely dependent upon his mom and dad for care, for protection. And obviously, we, every picture breaks down eventually. But the idea is the way that a child like Zephaniah trusts mom and dad is the way that we must trust our Heavenly Father. That they are a picture of faith for us in that way, in that particular aspect of dependence and trust. But also we know that children need training, that children need training. Back in Proverbs 22, verse 6, we read, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And when we looked at that verse several weeks ago, the word train carries with it the idea of dedicate. This is the type of training that is life dominating. It's the type of training that an Olympic athlete engages in. An Olympic athlete eats, sleeps, drinks, moves, everything for the purpose of being the best. So we, as the people of God, are to live our whole lives, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we do all to the glory of God. And our training of our children is to try and, and invibe that into them, that they would dedicate their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this training is needed because of their, their folly, because of the folly that is bound up in the heart of a child. 
Now, in the book of Proverbs, I've said, you know, recently I've been trying to, there's certain different characters that we encounter, right? We encounter wise people. We encounter fools. And then we encounter this, this group in the middle, the simple or the ignorant. The, um, you know, the simple is how it's described in verse 3 of this chapter. And they're just, they don't know yet. They haven't, they, and, and children are in this category. And they have folly bound in their hearts. And through the rod of correction and discipline, it can be driven from them. Or in the lack thereof, they become confirmed in it in fools. I'm pretty sure we're going to come to a verse that tells us that the rod of correction does not drive folly from a fool. And so we want to be wise people, wise people walking with the Lord. So our first question is, what is folly? What is this idea that is bound up in the heart of the child? Now, I have a story that I could tell that involves myself, my RAV4, and a boat trailer. Now, Dr. Blizzard, you've heard this story before. Hopefully you've forgotten. And please don't listen to your tonight. Listen for this moment. I got it in my head that I could take my family boating on the Columbia River and when I lived in St. Helens. And a friend of mine, he got a new boat, a nicer boat, so let, he let me borrow his older boat. This is not an actual picture of that boat. That's way too nice of a boat for the boat he borrowed. He let me borrow. It wasn't a dinghy, but it was uh, you know, one step up from that kind of deal. So I'd been out on the boat twice with him. What could go wrong? Well, everything went wrong. I got the boat in the water fine, but then as we started going, the throttle broke. I ended up hitting another boat because I couldn't put it in reverse. Only lightly. It was just a love tap. We got across. So what did I do? I can't figure out how it was working. So I go across the river. The Columbia River is deep enough for cargo ships. But, oh, what's the big deal? And we go across. Bethany was terrified. We get over to what's called Sand Island, an island made of nothing but sand. We're stuck there. The boat won't start. Everything's fine. I finally get it started and go meet the owner of the boat who figures out what the problem is. But the worst part of the whole story was when I went to get the boat out of the water. I don't know how to back up a trailer. And if you don't know how to back up a trailer and then you can't see the trailer because the boat's not on it, it was a disaster. The problem was... I didn't know how much I didn't know. I wasn't aware of all the things that could go wrong, all the struggles and issues I was going to face, because I was not practiced enough, I was not trained enough, I had not studied the subject enough. That is a picture of folly. Folly is the overconfidence of not knowing what you do not know. Now what I mean by that phrase is you think you know everything. In fact, in decision making, we come to this moment where we research a decision and we get enough facts and we decide, oh, I know enough now. 95% of the time when people think they know enough, they don't know enough. Which is why the Bible tells us we need to seek counselors. Wise counselors. We need to talk to other people. You think about this phrase, overconfidence. Confidence needs an object. So what I mean by that is, what are you confident in? What are you trusting in? Well, we can say it should always be in God. Always our confidence is in the Lord. Always we're resting and trusting in Him. Always we're hoping in Him. And with proper study, experience, and practice... We can have a, a certain confidence in our own skills, right? Eventually, if I had kept at it, I might be qualified to take a boat out today, All right? You can do that. Um, through uh, Hugh and Susie, I met one of the launch directors for SpaceX. So he's the guy that says, we're going to go. And I find this out, and I say to him, that's got to be a really stressful job. And he looks at me and says, huh? 
If I'm stressed out, that means I haven't trained and prepared enough. I need to know my job so well that it's just a, a simple thing. You know, on the one hand, I don't know if it was a little bit of bravado, but he makes a good point, doesn't he? Um, if you, you know, my, my experience with such things like that is, you know, for instance, taking a test. If I've studied hard for that test and I know that material and I'm ready for that test, it's fun to take a test. Right, kids? Anybody taking tests yet for school? Maybe you're too young. Or I, I lost you with the boat, huh? Okay. All right. Right? But with proper study and experience and practice, we have a, a sense of confidence. It's different than our confidence in God. Right? And it, it always needs to be mixed with humility. But our confidence must never be blindly in ourselves or in others. Never in ourselves. I was blindly confident that I could do the boat. I couldn't. And I had to suffer some of the consequences for that decision. And realized that I, there was a lot I didn't know. But you know, that also applies to others. We should never just blindly follow others either. That it, that is, is there. We should never just take it on what they call implicit faith. It means if, if they say it, I'll just believe it. No, we should always be thinking and investigating and seeking wise counsel. So folly is naturally bound up in the heart of a child. It's there. A child simply does not know yet all the dangers that are there. I went, went bike riding with a few of my kids recently, and we came to a stop sign, and they just kept right on going. And two of them did it. I said, what, guys, we're on the road. That car there has right away. and They had no idea. I realized that eh, maybe they shouldn't be going around the block yet. I need to go with them a few more times. I need to explain a few more things. So how do we deal with folly? Well, we deal with the rod of correction. That's a, a wooden spoon that lives in my house. It is not called a wooden spoon by the kids. You can imagine what it might be called. The rod of correction. What does that phrase mean here in verse 15 when it says the rod of correction shall drive it far from them? Well, ultimately, sort of zoomed out big picture, it's feeling the weight of bad decisions. It is suffering some sort of consequence for doing something wrong, right? It's, it's feeling the weight. Uh, you might remember, I, I came back from Olympia one time, and I told you a story about how behind the Olympia church, a couple houses burned down. And it was perpetrated by a group of kids. And those kids who burned down two houses, one had to be completely rebuilt, foundation up, went before the judge. Everybody knew they did it. They admitted they did it. And the judge says, kids will be kids. And not a single thing happened to them. Where do you think those kids, what, what do you think those kids learned from that? Maybe the fact of being arrested and stuff would scare them and so on and so forth. But they learned that their bad actions has no, no consequence. Just park yourself in any department store or grocery store or mall long enough and watch kids interact with their parents. And what do you see? Sadly, tragically, kids acting bad with no consequence. If your parents, I don't know how do I phrase this, your parents love you, and so they discipline you. And that's a great thing from the Lord. Now what's fascinating about this word correction is that in Proverbs, correction is the school of wisdom. This is where wisdom is learned through correction. A lot of times the word is translated instruction. That with their, that instruction is not just talking, but it is the application of instruction. It is feeling the weight of those um, uh, bad decisions. So fools despise it. Fools want nothing to do with it. Back in chapter 1, as we are introduced to the book of Proverbs and the concept of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And the word instruction there is the word correction, discipline. Fools have no need, no interest in it. We ought to buy it. 
Verse 23, 20, or chapter 23, verse 23, buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Again, the word instruction is the word correction. One of the, the things that sort of plagues our society is people don't want correction. They want affirmation. And to offer correction is to be presented as unloving and uncaring. So we want to present correction. We want to, to do the work that we need to do. But we want to make sure we're doing it in the right spirit. With the love of God. With our speech seasoned with salt. But firmly standing upon the word of God. This instruction comes by the fear of the Lord. These concepts go hand in hand. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. The fear of the Lord is the correction of wisdom, is the school of wisdom. When we're looking at God's word, when we're looking at the commandments of God, as we're looking at the rules that God has given us, and we're applying that to our lives, and when we, we find ourselves out of accord with those things, we confess that sin to the Lord and we repent of it. You know, and I don't have the reference that uh, I thought I had, but there, there's another reference, the fact that fools despise correction. And fools, the rod of discipline doesn't do anything for them. Part of wisdom, a huge part of wisdom, is recognizing there's a lot of things we do not know. So one of the reasons that we have wise counselor is because wisdom demands we check our blind spots. You know when you're, you're driving the car, everybody knows there's a blind spot in your mirrors, right? So what do you have to do? Before you ever change lanes, you gotta check the blind spot. You gotta glance there and see if there's something there. That's the principle of asking wise counselors. Hey, I have this plan. I'm going to make this big decision. I'm going to change this lane in my life, if you will. What do you think about the plan? And I'm going to talk to the kids right now, but I'm talking to everybody too. If you ever come up with an idea and you're afraid to tell mommy or daddy, it's probably a bad idea. You should go tell mommy and daddy before you do it. Right, dad? Yeah. And don't worry, I tell my kids that all the time because I've learned that lesson the hard way. Have a plan, don't want to tell anybody about it. Turns out it's a bad plan. So we should go tell other people. We should tell our mom and dad or our, our pastors and elders or the other wise counselors that the Lord has placed in our lives. Wisdom demands we check our blind spots. I think sometimes we get the concept that if you're wise, you know the answer. But the book of Proverbs repeatedly comes back to this idea. No, actually, wise people speak with other wise people because we all do have blind spots. And so may the Lord cause us, as it says, to buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom, instruction, and understanding that we might buy these things and walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word.